Hi everyone, good evening and welcome to our weekly Type 2 Members podcast. You'll know me at this stage, my name is Andy, I'm the clinical lead at ReadyCare. In today's podcast, what we're going to talk about is real practical stuff actually. We're going to start talking about food choices and what I eat in a day, just because I get asked this every now and again by patients, you'll get the um, just the inquiry, what did you have for breakfast now this morning or what would you usually have for lunches, just to kind of get some inspiration and it's great to help keep us all on track. Um, I've eaten this way for about, definitely about five or six years now and I would never, never go back. I mean, if you paid me, um, I was just over at a friend's house there and he had biscuits out and I said, no, I'm good, man. Um, you know, if you said to me, will we get pizza at the weekend? I'm just, it, it's not... It's not worth the trade-off for me to veer from this way of eating. And the reason it's not is because I feel so good. My mental clarity, my level of pain, body composition, being able to effortlessly keep weight off. I mean, I'm at a point now that, and I had gained a couple of stone over the years prior to eating this way, but I, I kind of struggle to keep weight on, which is not a bad complaint in this day and age, but I find it very difficult to go above um the kind of 13 stone mark maybe 12 stone 12 something like that and i do it pretty effortlessly i keep my weight down so it's not worth it for me um energy levels being up and down oh mental health by the way my mental health has been so much better i've been open about struggles with depression and anxiety in the past for a long long time um and eating this way my mental health is so much better and you can't put a price on that so uh this evening what i want to talk about is um what i eat in a day what a typical kind of day looks like for me um, why I eat that way um, and a couple of other bits and pieces. So let me just find do, 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 the slide deck I wanted to put up. Yeah, there it is. Okay, I'll get that up in a second. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the reasons why we all eat this way. So the the, the range of illnesses that eating a high carb, high sugar diet can lead to, uh, the ins and outs of how that works, the essential nutrients to be kind of looking for, and give you a couple of examples, might spur on a couple of ideas and just talk about how I eat as well. Okay, let's start with this. So this is hugely important to know. Apologies for the way the titles are coming across. It does that sometimes, but high insulin levels are at the root cause of chronic disease. We know this. This is very well understood in the literature. We know now heart disease, many cancers, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol, polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is the leading cause of infertility, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, a range of illnesses that are caused by overconsumption of processed foods. So the high blood sugar levels from refined carbs here you'll see in red are at the root cause of many illnesses. So for me, consideration when I'm eating a food is, is it high in carbohydrate and sugar? And by the way, carbohydrates and sugar are more or less the same thing. Consider them the same thing because carbs do boil down to sugar in the blood. All digestible carbs are broken down to glucose in the blood. So consider them the same thing. So I want to avoid carbohydrates that will spike my blood sugar levels that will increase that hormone insulin in the body and lead to all these chronic diseases. And I want to eat more protein and more fat. I would say on a daily basis, I'll rarely eat more than 30 grams of carbs in a day. Um, and it's it's easy now. It used to be difficult. It was very difficult at the start. I remember going, oh my God, I'm up to 80, 100, 120 grams of carbs. And um, But eventually I've kind of weaned off all the foods that would have been bumping up my carbs. So this is just a little bit more just expanding on the, the earlier point I was talking about in insulin leading to all these different diseases. So high levels of blood sugars lead to high levels of insulin. So again, um, a really important point here actually is that when your blood sugar levels go up from eating carbohydrates, your pancreas makes a hormone called insulin and insulin is right there in the middle of all of these. So insulin is not totally causative in, other, in, in all of them like cancer, the seed oils and different things that can lead to, to those illnesses. But the main driver of diabetes is diabetes is high levels of insulin cause the pancreas, the beta cells in the pancreas to fail. And that is by definition type two diabetes. Obesity. So we know the high blood sugar levels that cause the high insulin tends to lead to weight gain, which is why if you look at the prevalence of overweight or obesity in type two, it's very high. Dyslipidemia means high levels of cholesterol, uh, harmful cholesterol like triglycerides and low levels of good cholesterol. Hypertension is blood pressure caused by insulin. Epilepsy is not caused by insulin, but it makes it much, much worse. High levels of blood sugars make it much worse. Interestingly, the diet that a lot of you guys follow, low carb or ketogenic diet, was initially investigated back in, I believe it was 19, somewhere around 1910s, I think, um, as a treatment to 
restrict carbohydrates and increase fats in the blood to see could you get the brain to run on something else. And they found out for children, pediatric epilepsy, um, I think I think the remission rate is about 30 to 40% of kids with epilepsy on a well-controlled, well-formulated ketogenic diet. Actually, their seizures completely stopped. Um, there was a foundation built on the back of this known as the Charlie Foundation, but really interesting. Neurological disorders. We know for sure insulin is right there in the middle of causing Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and dementia um, because a lot of those are characterized by something called GLUT4 deficiency, meaning that the brain can't really use glucose for fuel anymore. And if you've been watching the talk around type 3 diabetes is what they're now calling uh, Alzheimer's. Parkinson's dementia. They're, they're basically insulin resistance in the brain, which is why there's a, a higher prevalence of Alzheimer's and dementia in type 2 patients. But again, if you go on a low carb diet, ketogenic diet, you drastically reduce the chances of that happening as well. Sleep apnea, um, buildup of fat in the back pad of the tongue, is caused by insulin resistance as well. Many cancers um, are now being viewed through the lens of that they might be a metabolic disease. And by that, I mean caused by high blood sugar levels as well. And PCOS and fertility issues, we know that as well, caused by high blood sugars too. So these are the reasons why I, for the most part, avoid carbohydrates personally. Um, so if we look at the foods that have little or no nutritional value, these, for me, and this is my own personal experience, I've, I've done a ridiculous amount of research into this stuff. I've got a little bit obsessed with metabolic health over the last seven or eight years in particular. Um, these are foods that, for me, have little or no nutritional value at all. First of all, anything carbohydrate based. Um, this is an important point as well, actually, is that there is no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. I think I covered this in the um, myths about low carb and ketogenic diets last week or the week before. But the idea that you need carbs for energy um, is conflating the fact that you can use carbohydrates for energy. So humans can use carbs for energy in the form of glucose, no doubt. Sugar and carbs can give you energy. You can also use what are known as ketones, and that's where ketogenic diet comes from. Ketones provide all of the fuel that the body needs, so running on fats. And anyone who's gone on a low-carb diet and drastically reduced their carbohydrate intake and upped their fat intake, relatively speaking, will attest to this and will say, yeah, my energy levels were actually much better when I went on a low-carb diet. Much more steady, no you know, peaks and slumps. Um, so you don't need any carbohydrates. The idea that your brain runs on carbs is nonsense. Your brain runs on glucose and all carbs turn to glucose, but your body has its own way of producing glucose. It's a wonderful uh, mechanism known as, or process I should say, known as gluconeogenesis. A little bit sciencey. Basically, it's the, uh, gluco is in glucose, neo is in new genesis to make. I think it comes from Greek or Latin, one of those, gluconeogenesis. It means to make glucose from protein. So the liver does that. It converts excess protein into glucose to fuel your brain and internal organs. But you need a tiny amount of glucose, a tiny, tiny amount of glucose, and you can get that from protein. So <clears throat> these foods have little or no nutritional value. The likes of breakfast cereals. I mean, I saw a paper done once where they investigated. Um, they put one food against another food. One of the foods was a corn flake cereal. I'm trying to be clever there and not uh, not catch myself out by saying a brand name, but it was a flaked corn cereal. And then they had a, a mystery kind of a thing that they were comparing it to. And the food item A was the corn flake cereal. Food item B was the, they didn't say what it was. So they compared the two and they came to the conclusion that if you're being completely objective, food item B actually had a higher nutritional value. And then they showed at the end of this experiment that food item B was the box that the corn flake cereal was in. There was slightly more nutrition in the, box of the flake cereal than there was in the cereal itself so where you have carbohydrate which is not an essential source at all we don't need it it's not an essential macronutrient and then you've lots of nonsense uh, so-called fortified with vitamins and minerals just chemical derivatives of vitamins that your body can't really absorb there's almost no nutrition in that there's really not um processed food is a general rule if it's deep fried if it's high carb is not good for you cakes pastries breads rice pasta the idea that even the Brown versions of the bread and rice and pasta are much better. It does not bear out when you look at the literature. Two slices of white bread, eight, nine, ten spoons of sugar in your blood. Two slices of whole grain or brown bread, so-called heart healthy stuff, seven, eight, nine spoons of sugar in your blood, depending on the brand. Um, I, I can't understand why anyone who understands metabolic health will come to the conclusion that brown bread is, is good for you. 
uh, or any type of rice and pasta for that matter. Deep fried foods, again, disastrous. Um, I don't, generally speaking, don't really touch any of these foods in, in any large amounts at all. And alcohol, um, every now and again, but not not all that often. I, I don't like what it does to me from a, a productivity point of view. I don't like getting up on a Sunday morning. I usually do a bit of work at the weekends and just feeling suboptimal. It's not, it's not good. And I can be cranky around the kids as well if I've had a couple of glasses away in the night before. Um, with a caveat that alcohol is great crack. I'm not going to sit here and say it's not. It is, to be fair. So every now and again. Um, so breakfast, lunch, dinner, these are the sort of things you say to patients. Eggs, coffee with cream and a bit of dark chocolate, full fat dairy. Um, I'm trying to think what my what's my latest thing. Sausage and eggs actually has been something we've had a lot of mornings, or two or three mornings a week recently. And the sausages that I personally go for, if you're listening in Ireland, I know it's a brand you'll definitely have is Clannock Hilti. Their gluten-free sausages are very low in carbs. I think it's four grams of carbs per hundred. But you'll get that in, in any half-decent brand of sausage. You can get the carbs quite low on them, so they're quite good. You'd be amazed how high the filler count is in some of them. They can be full of all sorts of rubbish, so be careful with that. Uh, keep it simple. So when it comes to lunch ideas, you know, your, your salads, obviously more applicable during the summer. Meat and vegetables, I do this a lot. I just chuck on a steak or a couple of, uh, you know, pan fry a couple of breasts of chicken and butter on and just have any other veg, cauliflower, broccoli, whatever's made for me, if I'm being honest. But that's, if I was cooking it myself, that's what I do. I'll do um, steak, mushrooms, onions, fry it all up in the pan and just have cauliflower boiling on the side. Soups can be great as well. So there's loads of recipes for that. You'll find loads of low-carb recipes online. Uh, burgers, we do this all the time when we're out and about. I go to a restaurant in Cork, if I'm in town, um, called Bunsen, B-U-N-S-O-N, I think it is. And it's we just get lettuce-wrapped burgers that look really similar to that picture, actually. Um, now that I think about it, I think that's my picture. So um, they're big kind of chunky burgers with cheese and, and an egg and bacon and stuff, and they're lettuce-wrapped. So that can be a handy idea as well. Um snacks wise and dinner is actually one of the one of my main go-tos will be a curry so i'll just get an indian curry from a takeaway and just have cauliflower rice with it and from a snacks point of view nuts dark chocolate berries and cream or greek yogurt and full fat cheese so for me these are my key nutrient dense foods that i have almost every day i will always have with the exception of sardines i'll always have red meat i, I eat red meat most days and I couldn't disagree more with the idea that red meat might be unhealthy for us. I, I really couldn't. Um, I've done a lot of work on this, looking at the the um, where the notion that red meat is linked to cancer and, and that sort of stuff. Just, I mean, nonsense. It just doesn't bear out in the literature at all. It's the idea that red meat increases your risk of cancer comes from correlative epidemiological data, which basically means food frequency questionnaire, where people say, you know, you look at a data set and you say the people who ate more red meat got more cancer, but there's lots of other things that would have caused the cancer. You know, you don't ask, were they smoking? You're not factoring in, were they sedentary? Were they eating their meat from McDonald's? How can you how can you possibly put um, hot dogs and um, grass-fed steak, organic steak, in the same category? But they are. That's what they do with these red meat studies. So um, they're entirely different things. And if someone is eating the hot dog where they having the bun with it, they likely were. Were they having chips with it? Were they having a milkshake and a dessert after it? Likely they were. There is not one study, nor will there ever be, that shows that the likes of steak and mints and proper red meat is linked to an increased risk of cancer. In fact, it's been exonerated from that in terms of its role in uh, in cancer completely. Um, so for me, eggs every day, um, red meat every day, liver at least once a week. And my kids eat liver three or four times a week. I actually hide it in a the recipe. They don't know what's in there, but they have it three or four times a week and then ideally if you can get oily fish in once a week that will cover almost all your bases in terms of nutrients um these are my personal favorite meals and these change all the time the picture is driving me mad because it's got rice in it and i know nobody somebody's going to catch me out on that i don't eat rice obviously this is just a random picture from the internet but um i'll often do fajita bowls or burrito bowls where i get um the contents of a fajita and i put it into a bowl We've been using wraps lately, all right, that they sell in, if you're listening from Ireland, they sell them in Little and Aldi. Actually, they have those in the UK as well. They sell them in Duns and Little, and they're called B-Free wraps. B-E, separate word, F-R-E-E. -E. They're called B-Free high-protein wraps, and they've got four grams of carbs per wrap. 
they're not amazing. I mean, they're fine, but it's just, it's nice to be able to hold stuff in a wrap and I'll have fajitas or burritos and those once a week. Um, or I'll just have it in a bowl if we don't get a chance to pick up the wraps. Omelets with cheese, bacon and eggs or sausage and eggs in the morning. Um, steak with mixed veg tends to be my kind of go-to for dinners. I'll often have that. Um, and then the recipe we've been having lately is chocolate ice cream. If anyone wants the recipe for this, let me know. We're currently making it up, but I can send you on the Word document. My wife makes it and it is amazing. It's so nice. I can't remember off the top of my head exactly what you put into it in terms of the measurements, but I do know it's got the most odd ingredient. You'd never think this worked. It's made with ripe avocados. I think she uses three ripe avocados. There's some coconut oil in there and there's erythritol, which is a sweetener. And she kind of mashes it all up and uh, sorry cacao obviously which is um the kind of chocolate powder stuff just m- mashes it all up mixes it all up together um and then puts it in a blender puts it into a kind of a tupperware type thing glass sorry glass kind of a, a bowl thingy big glass kind of a i'm trying to think of the word but i can't but it's a glass container anyway um puts it into the freezer and it takes maybe three or four hours to kind of half set and if you don't let it set properly it's it's like a really nice chocolate mousse and if you do, it's it's an amazing chocolate yogurt. But if anyone wants the recipe, just um, send me an email. Okay, so just to wrap up, guys, and I'll, I'll let you go then and, and get back to your evening. Um, the main approach when it comes to building the perfect diet is meat, if you eat meat. Obviously, if you don't, get some other kind of vegetable-based protein. But grass-fed meats, um, so by grass-fed, I just mean... Uh, in to be fair, in Ireland and England, the vast majority of meat is grass fed anyway. So this is more for our American guys and girls, where a lot of the time it can be feedlot, um, you know, grain and grain fed and grain finished, which is not as good for you. Either way, meat is so much healthier than um, you know your processed carbohydrates. So for me, it's the the kind of proper beef, fish, um, mussels, organ meats, liver, chicken, pork doesn't really matter to my mind the best quality meat and the healthiest meat comes from ruminant animals who are free to roam the land and graze as they should on a species appropriate diet so that's your beef and lamb they're they're to my mind the healthiest meats i've seen some evidence that chicken and pork tends to be a bit more inflammatory fish is great as well eggs again increasing your intake of eggs does not negatively affect your lipid profile there's more than enough evidence on that now Added fats. So for me, I want to add in some fats because fats are our fuel source if we're on a low carb diet. So I tend to choose fats that my grandparents would recognize as cooking fats. So they tend to be um, butter, coconut oil, uh, lard. So we cook everything at home in tallow, beef tallow. I get that in Duns personally. I get organic tallow in uh, in Duns. Um, But any of those should be absolutely fine. And then low sugar fruits and vegetables. So any vegetable really with the exception of potatoes if you're diabetic. And your low sugar fruits are going to include berries, melon, and so on. Um, As a general rule, and this might answer your question, Nikki. um, Let me pop this across. So yeah, tomatoes are okay. They're absolutely are. So tomatoes are, um, they're moderately high in carbs, but we tend not to eat the same volume that we would in, in, say, for example, potatoes or sweet potatoes or anything like that. You know, we don't have a, a plate with like six tomatoes on it. Um, you know, you, you tend to have one with a salad or, or or one or two in a recipe. So absolutely, they're fine. Uh, and I hope you keep them well. Good to hear from you. So meat, eggs, added fats and low sugar fruits and vegetables. So that's just a, a little bit of insight, guys, as to um, my sort of... Uh, roughly how I map out my my week's eating. Um, and just to sum up here, just some tips for simple meals. Keep your breakfasts basic. So high quality sausages and eggs or bacon and eggs, anything like that. Um, for your main meals, go for meat and veg. Keep it nice and easy, avoid potatoes and just go for any meat, any veg with the exception of the potato family. Lunches, you can always have stir fries. They're quick and easy. Remember, you can have curries and cauliflower rice. So that's a good one just to keep in mind. And again, stick to the kind of um, berries and Greek yogurt or berries and cream for your dessert and avoid the the sugary stuff that we all love, if we're being honest about it. It's certainly worth it in the long run. 
Um, a phrase I want you to keep with you because I heard it recently and it really stuck with me and I'm going to steal it and use it as my little tagline is eat like your life depends on it because it does. Have a good evening, guys. Thanks so much for being here with us. I really appreciate it. Please be sure to like this video and then hit the subscribe button here and the notification bell on the other side. And we'll see you next week. Have a good evening and take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.